It's my pleasure now to introduce Mr. Eric Krohn, security awareness advocate at No Before. Eric, take it away. Hey, thank you, David. Uh, always a pleasure to be here and I uh, love doing these. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about the ransomware hostage rescue manual, which should be available to you in the resources. Um, this is a great, great document uh, if you've ever uh, considered the impacts that, that ransomware has. And what I recommend people do with this is go ahead and uh, print it out, have it available uh, in hard copy in case things go horribly wrong. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a lot of organizations that have found just how bad uh, ransomware attacks can uh, uh, can cripple an organization, and you really don't want to be running around trying to find this sort of thing or an incident response plan or any of that stuff in electronic uh, format when all of that stuff's gone away. So just a little tip and trick will start there. So having said that, my background, um, I'm an IT and security guy. I've been around since the 1990s. Uh, I've worked with ISC Squared. Uh, I worked with the Department of Defense for about 10 years um, over in the uh, uh, Fort Huachuca area. And, uh, you know, I, I've seen a lot of things over the years. Honestly, ransomware is one of those things that, that I see causing so much damage, uh, more so than most things I've seen in the past. So uh, it's important that we get our arms around this and be ready to deal with it, hopefully prevent it, and if not, be able to recover from it quickly. Um, unfortunately, the folks that I've talked to that have been hit by this stuff, they've really kind of been at a loss for how to deal with it. And that's why we put together this manual. Um, that's why we're doing this webinar right now is to, to help prepare you a little bit better. So anyways, uh, no before that's who I work for. Uh, we're based out of uh, Tampa, Florida area. Um, we've got about 26,000, maybe 27,000 customers right now. So we see a lot of this stuff. Uh, we hear a lot of the stories. Um, unfortunately, a number of people come to us when it's too late. Now, where we work in uh, the space that we're in is the security awareness training and simulated phishing area. So we help uh, help educate the end users how to avoid uh, triggering this sort of thing, including other types of malware as well. You know, we all know that the users are are pretty much the key people that. Uh, uh, that seem to cause the problems in, inside, um, and we know that attackers are targeting them. So it's no surprise. Not really their fault if they don't understand the, the risks that they're facing. So having said that, let's get started. We're going to cover these uh, sections now. I'm going to be shooting through this really, really quickly. So this is kind of an overview. There's just too much to deal with uh, and to cover in this short amount of time. Uh, but you know, hopefully this will give you an idea of what's going on. And again, I highly recommend you download the manual. So what we, uh, what we are all aware of is in the last five, six years, um, cyber crimes really changed how it's gone, right? It used to be, uh, you know, individuals doing this sort of thing. Well, now ransomware is really, really uh, accelerated in what it's doing. Uh, and the key to ransomware is, and what, what's really um, turned the tables on this has been obviously uh, cryptocurrency, um, the ease at which the people can be anonymous. We're, we're going to talk about all this as we're going in here. Um, but the key to ransomware is that even if your data that you have in your organization doesn't seem like it would be valuable to someone else, it is absolutely valuable to you because you can't do your work if you don't have your data, right? So everybody, everybody is susceptible to this. And uh, what a lot of people don't even think about is it's, it happens to people at home as well as in the office. So we got to worry about this at home in the office, our kids' pictures being, you know, uh, ransomed, uh, encrypted, all that kind of good stuff. Anywhere that you're willing to spend money, this is where the bad guys are going. Now, Average cost of a ransomware attack on a business, about $133,000. Here's an interesting one. And these are from uh, Kaspersky and Sophos, uh, these numbers here. 75% of companies infected with ransomware were running up-to-date endpoint protection. That's important to understand, especially if you're running the older type signature-based endpoint protection. It's really not going to be very helpful for you. Now, 34% of businesses hit with malware took a week or more to regain access to their data. Imagine being in the position where you have to function for a week. Now, what is ransomware? Well, it can take different forms, but in essence, uh, yeah, it, it basically takes over your files, 
and it's going to deny you access until you pay. Um, what's interesting about it is the way it kind of functions here. So uh, not only can it encrypt the files in the workstation, it can also go across the network. Now the way it works is the ransomware is often downloaded to a machine. From that machine, the infection starts, and now it starts to spread out on the network. It looks for file servers, looks for database servers oftentimes, and of course this is all uh, dependent upon the particular strain you get. But only after it's done that damage does it lock the actual workstation it ran from. I mean, that's kind of smart. You don't want to warn somebody that something's going on until it's too late to do anything about it. But that's the key thing that happens here is uh, the download happens, uh, it gets triggered, and then it's, it starts doing um, stuff out on the network as well. Now, not every strain does this, but a large portion of them these days have moved from doing just that workstation to anything that's connected to it, or even being able to just browse shares on the network. So uh, it's, getting, uh, it's getting pretty scary, the amount of damage it can do. We saw this in WannaCry and how quickly it spread through the NHS, and that really opened a lot of people's eyes to just how significant these attacks can be. Now, once the files are encrypted, it's gonna pop up a screen like this. The idea behind this is they want it to be in your face once it's happened. They want you to know that you've been infected and they want to show you how to pay for it. That's kind of the key to these things. Um, they will do whatever they can to make sure that you know to go, uh, where to go to pay the ransom. Uh, after all, they're in this for the money, right? So when it comes to the actual encryption, yeah, they don't mess around. Uh, it's RSA 2048, it's very, very strong encryption. So you're not gonna be able to necessarily brute force the encryption here. That's, that's the important takeaway with this. Um, there have been some times where uh, they've been able to get decryptors to work. Usually that's just like in, in other cases where crypto doesn't work or there's a, a vulnerability. They find ways that the key management is not being handled correctly and things like that. But the actual encryption itself is not something you're going to just brute force. So another, oh geez, how do I even phrase this? I guess another development in the ransomware world, which is a little bit dismaying, is ransomware as a service. So we have everything else as a service, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, all that kind of good stuff. Well, the ransomware developers went, hey, you know, maybe that's a good idea for us to do as well. So they developed this ransomware as a service scheme. Now, what makes this so powerful is, first of all, a lot of these cost zero dollars to get involved with. It's a profit sharing model. So uh, sometimes the split is up to 70% for the attacker and 30% for the developer. Uh, but basically people that are scam artists, con artists, uh, things like that, uh, but don't have the technical knowledge to write this stuff can now get in the game. When this all started, they, uh, the attackers both had to write the ransomware and perform the attacks, but that's no longer what's going on because of the ransomware as a service model. So imagine it costs you nothing to get into this and you get 70%. You know, what's holding you back if you have no morals or scruples from doing this? Now, Payment, that's the other thing. <laughs> this is where it boils down to, um, you know, why it's so hard to get people on this. First, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, anonymity available on the internet these days, and we'll talk a little bit more about that with Tor and things. But the way that people usually got busted in ransom situations was in the payment collection or the payment transfer part. So, it's usually, you know, you, you think about the movies where you got the big bag of cash and you got to leave it here and there, but they have, you know, agents in the bushes and ghillie suits and things like that. Uh, that's where people usually got busted was in the, the payment transfer. Well, now that we have cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency is very, very hard to trace. Uh, it's very easy to launder into tiny little pieces and there's services that do that. It's almost impossible to track where the money goes uh, once the payment's been made. So, the big thing where people used to get busted is now gone. Um, that's what makes it so hard to do this. Now, crypto mining, um, it's important that we understand this because this has been running hand in hand uh, because again, these guys are out for money, right? So this has been going hand in hand with ransomware. And we find a lot of times when a ransomware um, 
uh, when ransomware is installed, they're also installing other software like crypto mining. So the idea here is it's going to take your hardware and it's going to do these, uh, um, these cryptographic puzzles essentially, right? Um, it, it's, it's deeper than this, but this will give you the kind of, you know, 10,000 foot overview. Uh, but basically it's going to be solving these, these problems. Now, Cryptocurrency, when you mine it, the problem is it's gotten to the point where it costs you more in power and hardware and resources uh, to actually generate the cryptocurrency than you earn with it, right? So the bad guys figured, hey, here's a great idea. Let's take other people's devices, let's take other people's computers, and let's have them do the work for us. It doesn't cost us anything in power, it doesn't cost us anything like that. And all of a sudden, they're making money off of this. Well, um, this stuff targets all kinds of things from uh, smart TVs, um, smartphones, uh, to just your regular old workstations. You know, middle of the night, people go home. These machines are free to do whatever they want. So we're seeing this put together in there um, along with uh, the ransomware. It's called crypto jacking. So it takes a lot of computing power and electricity to be very profitable, like I said. And they're, they're doubling up on this, right? Um, this is again another way for them to make money. So keep this in mind. Uh, this is why it's important, and you're going to hear this message a couple times. If you get infected by ransomware, when you clean those machines, you wipe them and start over again. Uh, you also may want to keep an eye on this sort of thing at the same time as well. Start monitoring your processes and seeing if your CPU or GPUs are going extremely high in the middle of the night. That could be a sign of this sort of thing. So Again, this is oftentimes creating the same kind of cryptocurrency they're going to try to get you to pay in a ransom. Now, the other part of staying anonymous is the Tor network. So the Tor network is, uh, it's the onion router network. And basically the idea here is uh, it, it keeps you anonymous when online. Now, the key is uh, they have to have a uh, different domain names or, or kind of the the end of the domain name, instead of ending in a, a, a .com or .org, they always end in a .onion. A lot of times they're kind of a random number and you need to have a special browser to get into it. So the way it works is essentially it connects in and then randomly bounces you between other um, people in the Tor network. Um, so they're, they're bouncing you between other nodes uh, and before you know it, it's very, very hard to kind of figure out where you came from. Now, again, you can't get there from a normal browser. It has to be done through a special browser, um, but it's pretty interesting. So anything that ends in dot .onion, um, and here's a little nugget. It, it was originally de uh, developed by uh, DARPA and the U.S. Naval Research Lab. Uh, the idea was it was a place for whistleblowers to be able to anonymously go and, uh, and report things, right? So uh, again, every time we do something nice, it seems the bad guys weaponize it. Um, the key is though, the Tor browsers are available for pretty much um, any operating system and smartphones. I have it on my iPhone, I've had it on Android, Mac, um, and the Tor browser is available for it. You're gonna need to know this because most of the time if you're infected, this is where they're gonna host the page where you go to pay. So. Uh, on to this, uh, have I been infected? So the infection piece, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, you can't get to files, you can't get to things like that. Uh, the message has popped up somewhere. Now, what's key about this is sometimes the message has popped up on another machine in the network. You don't know this because someone else launched it, right? Um, but if you start seeing a lot of files uh, with different extensions or the same extension in shares and things like that, uh, that's going to be a key uh, note that something is going on there because they'll typically rename the file with the same extension. Um, you'll also usually see some sort of text files in there. And these are going to give you the information you need as well as the pop-up screen where you go to pay the ransom. Again, they're in this for money, so they want to make sure that you have every opportunity to pay them. So first thing you do if you're infected is disconnect from the network, okay? Uh, now, before you do this, uh, I will say kind of a step point five, I guess, is make sure you know what you're connected to. Uh, so if you have external drives, make sure you know where they're plugged into. Make sure you know what network drives were mapped. Um, 
make a note of that as soon as you can, and then you disconnect. The reason is, uh, and we'll talk about this later, when you, if you do go to decrypt these files, you'll need to have all that stuff reconnected in order for it to go out and for the decryptor to work. So make sure that you unplug it from the network, turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, uh, unplug any storage devices, but do not erase anything or try to clean up any files or use antivirus. Uh, at this point, honestly, it's too late, okay? So just unplug everything. Now, if it's hit some uh, files out on the shares or something like that, um, you need to figure out which, which machine did that, the patient zero, if you will. If you check the properties of the file, you should be able to figure that out and then take it back to the workstation that's actually infected. Now, uh, you also need to determine the scope. You want to know how bad the damage is, okay? Um, you, you want to look at any of those shared drives, uh, network storage, external drives, any of that kind of stuff. Even make sure that the cloud storage, like Dropbox and Google Drive and stuff like that, um, check those and see if those have been encrypted as well. There's been ransomware strains that have gone after those, uh, those types of files as well if you have a connector on your machine. Um, so uh, all things said and done, it can be pretty, pretty ugly and get in a whole lot of places. So it's really important to understand what's been hit. Now you want to know what the strain is next. Uh, because of all the differences in the nuances and the strains of ransomware, this is an important step. Uh, believe it or not, ransomware gets versioned, it gets uh, patched, it gets all of those things, right? As soon as a vendor releases a a decryptor, the bad guys turn around and they patch against that. It's really, it, it's amazing to see this kind of work, but this is how it goes, right? So you want to know what the strain is. You want to know, does it just go after files on a single workstation? Does it have the capabilities of, of hitting, um, you know, the, uh, the network? Does it just do the files? Does it do the boot sector on the hard drive? That's another one. Uh, some of them take other options other than Bitcoin, they may take Monero or Ethereum or one of those other kinds of cryptocurrencies for payment. Um, also, there are some free decryption tools for the certain strain. So if you get lucky and you go over to um, ID Ransomware and you find out that this is one of the ones that's okay, you may be able to decrypt it without paying. Um, the other thing is, uh, some of these versions, uh, they will... Uh, they'll offer tech support, believe it or not. Uh, and in some cases, they'll extend the amount of time you have to pay, or you may be able to negotiate down the amount. But if you don't know what strain it is, you, you know, you're really kind of going into those negotiations blind. So that's another key reason for knowing that. Now, once you're infected, you basically have four responses. Um, and the four responses are you can restore from a backup. You can decrypt it using third-party decryptor. You can do nothing, or you can negotiate and pay the ransom. Now, these are kind of an order of preference uh, from best to worst, right? You're, the best thing you can do is restore from a recent backup. Um, it's, you know, if you have good backups, awesome, great. We'll talk about that a little bit, but, you know, the last thing you want to do is pay these folks. Um, some organizations have policies that say we will not pay the ransom, period. Uh, and if that's your organization, then you know that uh, number four is right out and you may need to do something else. But be aware of how long you have to fix this and whether or not paying the ransom is an option. Now, pretty much every uh, uh, ransomware out there is going to have a countdown timer and either it's going to randomly delete files or it's going to increase the amount that you owe or something along those lines. The idea is it's generating urgency for you to go take care of this. So understand that you're gonna be up against a deadline. Now, um, <clears throat> again, if you're in a situation where your policy says we're not gonna pay it, then you can have a little bit more time looking at the other responses. Uh, if your backup or restore failed, then the priority needs to be given to the response most likely to get results in a shorter time frame. Uh, so you start looking down that list there. Uh, so the first response was restore from a backup. Even if you don't have a backup solution in place, uh, there may be ways to recover files that you were unaware of. So this is kind of reaching out to, we have a, um, some critical files that were um, encrypted, but you know maybe we can live without most of them. Um, you may actually have a way to recover some of these files. 
Um, some of these things may be something like, uh, um, you know, uh, Dropbox or something like that. Um, there's a lot of different ways, but what we recommend you do is first of all, uh, if you do have backups available, begin the restore process and manual verifications. Um, make sure that they are backed up and recoverable um, and make sure you know how long it's going to take to restore it. I find this is a problem sometimes for people that do cloud-based uh, backups where they say, oh, well, you know what, I can back up a, or I can restore a workstation in 27 minutes, for example. However, when you have a thousand workstations to restore that 27 minutes, just because of the bandwidth issues that you have, um, goes through the roof, right? It's not scalable like that. So people sometimes get a little bit uh, um, surprised by that. So, you know, know the files that you need. Uh, if you don't need everything, concentrate on getting the key ones back. Uh, if you don't have backups or if they're not, if they haven't worked, look for email copies of those files, right? You may have included an attachment that got emailed. Um, they may be saved somewhere on a local workstation. Uh, they may be in Dropbox. They may be in one of those sorts of places, which sometimes do versioning. So even if the ransomware can get in there and encrypt one version or if it gets synced up, sometimes you can pull an old version out. So that may be some of the ways that you can do um, some of the backups you hadn't thought about. Also, shadow copies. These are done on occasion. Uh, you may not even realize it, but sometimes, not always, um, these snapshots are taken uh, during an install, uh, an update, a patch, something like that. There are some ransomware that seeks out shadow copies and deletes them uh, because, again, they know if you can restore this, they're not making money. So this is another option that you may look at. There's some some things that happen behind the scenes sometimes where you might get lucky. And, and again, this usually works if you need some key files, but not necessarily if you need to restore everything. So um, once you have verified the files you need, you're able to recover them. You know, now you got to uh, remove the ransomware. Uh, again, I, I say this and you're going to hear me say this again too. Uh, don't just restore the files and continue working. Uh, it just doesn't work well that way. Uh, make sure that you wipe the machine completely before you do that. Uh, there's just other types of malware that can be uh, downloaded with this, with the droppers. You just don't know what's on there. Uh, but once you're confident, you know, that it's all gone, you've, uh, you know, you've re, uh, re imaged the machine, then you can now restore your files. So the next step is one that's often forgotten is prevention, right? Figure out how it came in in the first place and stop it from happening again. A lot of times people get to the point that they restore stuff, they take a deep breath and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that's over with. Uh, and then they kind of uh, lollygag around on the prevention part. Uh, unfortunately, that can lead to reinfection, um, all kinds of things like that. So make sure that you've taken precautions. Now, most ransomware these days is spread through the person. It's an attack on the person in the chair in front of the computer. Make sure that your people are trained, that they know how to spot these sorts of crazy links or, you know, looking for infected documents and phishing and stuff like that. Um, you also want to make sure that if your endpoint protection didn't catch it, well, why not? You know, maybe you need to tweak some things. Maybe you need to look at a different option. Um, you need to take those sorts of things and, and fix them, right? If you had RDP open at the internet and somebody came in that way, you need to close that door. So don't forget the prevention part. Now, uh, we do have a ransomware prevention checklist. It's in the book here. Double check that, look through it, run through it. There's a lot of good information in there. Now, some technical controls. These were from uh, Steve Reagan at CSO. Um, avoid mapping your shares and hide your network shares, right? Doing a simple dollar sign to the share name will keep it from being enumerated. Uh, focus on the principle of least permission. So if somebody has permissions to view a file but not to modify it, they can't encrypt it. So if you have, like, say, a network share that, uh, you know, an S drive or something where everybody puts their files from marketing to everyone else, uh, make sure that only the people that actually need to write to those files can write to those files. Don't let, uh, you know, marketing be able to write to accounting, et cetera, et cetera. So look at the principle of these permission there. Um, block file extensions via email. 
So there's really no reason to allow .js, .wsf, or you know any of those files to come in. You want to be scanning the contents of zip files. Um, there are you know other things there too, but make sure that you're blocking those extensions. Uh, don't forget, install the old crypto locker uh, software restriction policy. It's not perfect, but it can block some uh, malware from working um, effectively. Uh, limit where things can run from, right? Uh, if you can run on a whitelist approach, it is more time intensive, uh, intensive, but it's also much safer. There seem to be more um, uh, organizations out here that are working on ways to make that easier too. But whitelisting is a, is a great approach. It's not 100%. Yes, you can get around it, but um, you know, it beats a blacklist, honestly. Um, it's much more effective. Now, uh, make sure your backups are good. If you were able to, to restore, yay, good for you. Hopefully you've learned something from it. Um, fact is, even if you restore to some external USB drive, it's better than nothing. Uh, so make sure you do something. Make sure you do you know, some sort of backup, some sort of ways to do that. And this goes at home as well as uh, in the commercial world. Now, the second response you have, uh, other than restoring, uh, is to try to decrypt it, right? This is number two on our list. Uh, certain versions have the encryption keys cracked or, uh, or done, right? So this is kind of nice. I love it when they do this and they're able to find this and there are people that still work very, very hard on this. The problem is uh, it works in like, what, 5% of the cases, maybe even less. Um, so it's not something that you're liable to, uh, to be able to rely on, but it's great when it does work. So if you're going to try to decrypt, head out there and try, first of all, determine the strain. Again, you need to know what it is. If you go to ID ransomware, you can upload a sample up there and it can tell you what it is. Um, sometimes, um, they will change a version number of the ransomware. Like if you're trying to look at it, um, but it can see through that. Uh, the reason they would do that is if there has been a crack for it and they haven't updated it, but they want to make it look like they have, they may fake a version number, which is crazy, but hey, who knows? Uh, but this is a great way to do that. See if, it, uh, see if it works. They can point you to a good decryptor sometimes. Now, when you do get the decryptor or the unlocker for... For the love of all that's good in this world, folks, get it from a reliable antivirus source. Uh, unfortunately, there are folks out there that will pretend to be a decryptor or an unlocker, and they're just going to do more damage, or it's other malware, it's things like that. So get it from a reputable source. Uh, check some of the security forums. Bleeping Computer is great about stuff like this. Um, Google is your friend. Just make sure that you get that decryptor from somewhere that's, uh, that's reputable. And finally, um, if you're lucky, if you've been successful, awesome, uh, fantastic. Give kudos to the folks that have, uh, that have saved you uh, a lot of problems here, right? Take precautions again to avoid this in the future, right? Step number four, the last one there, make sure you prevent it. Uh, more than likely, you're gonna fail, okay? Um, but hey, you can keep trying to restore backups, you can try to negotiate. Um, and on the smaller ransoms, it's, it's not very common, uh, but on the larger ones, you a lot of times can negotiate that ransom. Uh, I knew a city that uh, I did a talk for, I was talking to them. Uh, they were hit, they were told that it was going to be an eight, uh, $50,000 ransom, I believe it was. And they told, they ended up talking the folks down. They just said, Hey, look, we don't, we don't have that kind of a budget. We're a small town. Um, and they ended up getting them down to like $8,000. And it was one of those, look, if, if you can't take that, we're just going to go ahead and, and start over again because we can't afford it. So it can happen. Negotiating can happen, but it's usually going to be on the larger ransoms. They're not going to waste their time negotiating on a $500 per workstation ransom. Uh, the third response in our list there was do nothing. And this is a very valid approach. Um, a lot of organizations just do this. They just wipe the machine. They lose whatever's on that machine um, and they just kind of move on, right? Uh, sometimes you can take that. Sometimes you can take that, uh, you know, that hit and move on. Sometimes they're not mission critical. Um, so that may be a valid option. Uh, just understand that, uh, you know, um, 
hopefully you're in this position to be able to do that. Now, the FBI says never pay the ransom. Uh, but here's the deal. If it's a matter of you having to shut down your business uh, as opposed to paying the ransom, you know, this is a business decision. And so doing nothing may not be an option for you. It may be, you know, you got to close the doors if this happens. If your intellectual property has been encrypted, you can't get anything back. Uh, that can be a serious problem. So if you are going to do that, though, make sure that you wipe that machine, right? Nuke it from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Um, wipe the entire machine and start over. Uh, don't just delete the encrypted files and call it good. Um, one thing that I will recommend here is if you're going to do this, uh, do a backup of those files because who knows, they may release a decryptor later on. You may be able to get some of that information back. Uh, but again, nuke it from orbit, wipe that machine completely. Again, back up your files here. Um, yeah, this is interesting. There was a, a case where a ransomware developer um, got a flash of conscience and decided to release uh, the decryption keys for all of the files that the people had been infected. Not something you can count on, folks but it does happen. So make a backup of it. Again, even if it's a USB drive from Walmart or Best Buy or whatever, no big deal. Uh, you might just get lucky down the road. Um, step three, prevention, 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 right? Again, a lot of people forget about this step or they go, oh, I'll take care of this later. For whatever reason, they're so relieved that they've moved on from the immediate issue um, that they take too long doing this. But learn from the mistakes that were made get countermeasures in place, um, get that, that good endpoint protection in place. Uh, again, don't rely on it. Uh, make sure your backups are working so you're not in this position again and get your people trained so that they won't launch it again because more than likely this is how it started. Now the fourth response on our list, negotiate and or pay the ransom. If you have exhausted all your other options and you must have your files back, uh, you may have to pay the ransom. Thing is, um, it's not as easy as you may think. Uh, there's more steps to this if you're not prepared for it than you may consider. Um, the other question I always get though is, will I get the files back if I pay? The answer is yes, maybe. Most of the time, uh, these folks are, are trying to get that back, right? If ransomware gets a reputation of paying and not getting your information back, people are going to quit paying. That's a fact of life. So that's why they have actually really good tech support in a lot of cases, which is mind blowing to me. Uh, but this is a fact. Um, what does happen sometimes though is uh, either the command and control channels are taken down by law enforcement or an ISP. So there's no way to restore it. Um, sometimes there's actually been some strains out there that there is no way to decrypt it, but they're actually riding on the, uh, uh, the reputation of those that have gotten their data back after paying. Um, there's been some issues. If you look back at the old MongoDB attacks, uh, when they were attacking open MongoDB servers, where sometimes the, the, the attackers, they would encrypt the MongoDB database and other folks were coming in and they were actually changing the Bitcoin wallet ID and the notification. So you would be sending money to the wrong people, which is pretty wild. I mean, I guess there's no honor among thieves, right? Um, but there are a number of reasons that you may not get your files back. Uh, there's also been known um, issues when you decrypt the files with some uh, file corruption. All right, just a fact of life when you're dealing with stuff like this. Uh, so the answer is yes, maybe. Um, I would go so far as to say probably, but even that's still not 100%. So when you're going to pay this, what do you do? Well, first of all, again, they pop this stuff up in your face pretty good. It's going to tell you where to pay, uh, how much to pay, uh, amount of time left to pay. Sometimes there'll be a, uh, a Russian roulette on here that starts deleting files every two hours just randomly uh, until you pay. Again, all, all to try to get you to hurry, all in a sense of urgency here. Uh, you're going to need to have some sort of a, a cryptocurrency account with the Bitcoin exchange or a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, and you're going to need to purchase some Bitcoin. Uh, we use Coinbase.com. There are many others out there. Make sure they're legitimate too. You really don't want to open an account with a uh, uh, an unknown uh, cryptocurrency uh, group that then takes off with your money, right? There are scammers on every corner uh, in this particular ransomware type neighborhood like this. 
Uh, it can take time to do, and this can be a little bit of an issue when there's a countdown timer. Some organizations used to keep Bitcoin on hand. I don't recommend it because it's so amazingly volatile. What I do recommend though is set up an account, at least have an account set up so that that part of it is taken care of uh, beforehand because there can be some delays in getting accounts set up. Now, once you get an account, you get a uh, wallet address. It looks kind of like this. Um, this is where the, the Bitcoin will be deposited. Some purchase methods can take a few days, uh, especially for new accounts. And that's, again, some of the key there. Get the account taken care of. You may be able to go to some of the sites like localbitcoins.com if you're kind of against a deadline. You're going to pay for it, though. It's going to be a premium price for stuff like that, if it even helps. So... You are probably going to need the Tor browser. It may be optional, but you're probably going to need Tor. Remember, this is where you're going to go to actually get the information on that, um, to put in that uh, the, the wallet address and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, it's going to end in .onion. Make sure that you download your browser from torproject.org. Do not get it from any other website. Remember, we're talking about a web browser here, and it's going to be things that's going to be um, reading websites, um, and it's you know going out to some darker areas on the web anyways. Uh, there have been times where people have integrated essentially proxies in these, that whenever it goes to somewhere and it sees a Bitcoin wallet address, it inserts their own number. Imagine that, right? Again, no honor among thieves, um, but make sure you get it from Tor Project because otherwise you don't know what's being monitored. You don't know what's happening. Uh, it's just not a good place to be. Um, that address again for that will be on the screen. You see a couple of example uh, website addresses there. Again, they end in .onion. That's going to be in that uh, decryption instructions file or on screen for you. Now you're going to end up paying it, right? So you're gonna transfer money to the other uh, wallet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they may want you to get a transaction ID or hash generated when you get it, but most of the time um, it happens pretty quickly and they don't need that. Um, but you know, you never know. Uh, generally speaking, you just uh, kind of throw the, uh, um, you know, throw the money at them and once they receive it, then they will, uh, they will get back with you. Now, here's where it gets uh, a little bit crazy. Uh, decrypting your files. Remember in the beginning, we said that when you disconnect everything, make sure you know how to reconnect it. So they're going to send you a decryptor and or a key. Um, make sure you have all of that other stuff reconnected before you start decrypting, or you may end up not being able to decrypt those files. So just absolutely positively make sure all of that stuff is reconnected the way it was. Um, it, it may take a little while for them to get this. Once you get it um, and you start running it, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while to decrypt these files. Um, when they encrypt them, they're trying to do them as quickly as possible. Um, decryption generally takes a little bit longer. Um, make sure if you can to confirm these files again, when it decrypts these, there has been some situations where uh, files have been corrupted during the decryption process. So it's important uh, to, to double check that uh, wherever possible to make sure that things look right. So um, the best way to do this, honestly, is to avoid infection in the first place, right? Um, nobody wants to have to deal with this. Uh, the way to deal with this is an, an in-depth approach, right? Uh, a layered approach, if you will, defense in depth. Uh, you need good endpoint protection or antivirus. Uh, there's been arguments about endpoint protection is dead. Uh, don't believe it, although I will say that uh, signature-based stuff is pretty much pointless these days. So when you do endpoint protection, uh, make sure you have something good that's got... Uh, you know, heuristics or some sort of an AI in there, things that look at user behavior, um, not just a bunch of signatures because they're, they're just running around those like crazy. Uh, try to segment your network wherever possible. This way, if one or two machines gets infected, it can't spread like it did at the NHS, right? 
uh, you may only have to restore five machines instead of 250. And, uh, you know, although your day is still going to not be much fun, it's a whole lot better only having to get a little bit. And by segmenting the network, you can hopefully keep things from spreading. Limit those permissions, like I said, um, you know, if they can't modify the file, they can't encrypt it. Uh, make sure you have good spam filters and, uh, you know, email gateways in a way that are going to uh, hopefully block a lot of these known attacks. Now we know that the, you know, best of breed usually still allows about 10 to 15% of the attacks through, but the deal is that the amount of attacks that are going on these days, even that is is remarkably effective and very helpful to keep those attacks out of the user's inbox. Um, weapons grade backups, again, can't say enough about this. Um, if you take this list and flip it, that's my top to bottom um, most important things to do. Uh, weapons grade backups being number two on my list. And by weapons grade, I mean, it, it's got to be tested. It's got to be something that you know works well. Um, and, uh, you know, it just needs to cover all of those things. Do not leave things out on network shares. Those are far too often encrypted. We see that happen all the time. Oh, I thought I had good back backups, but they were on a network share that ended up encrypted. So guess what happened to your good backups? Um, make sure that that stuff is taken care of and tested. And then finally, um, last but certainly not least, and number one on my list is get some new school security awareness training. Again, that's how most of this stuff is spread is by getting people to click on links or open documents that are infected. Um, and if you can reduce that, uh, you're going to have a whole lot better day. Now, security awareness training also doesn't just cover phishing, but how they're dealing with passwords, right? Another key infection point is when users are reusing passwords across multiple um, platforms and one of those platforms ends up getting owned. Um, you know, So it's not just about phishing, but it's also about most of the other attack points that seem to be happening as well. So on the user side, we know that they're the last line of defense. About 91% of successful malicious data breaches start with the spear phishing attack. Business email compromise is going crazy. And one of the things that people don't think about um, when it comes to the user side um, and, and the infection side is they're not always after immediate money. Like the W-2 scams are after data. They get the tax forms and uh, file taxes on behalf of the users. Uh, during the first quarter. So it's not always about direct money. Sometimes it's about data they can use to turn into money. So when it comes to training your people, you, you can't just throw them up in a room in front of a bunch of PowerPoints once a year and expect it to work. Uh, if you need compliance, bang, you can do it that way. But honestly, uh, it's too serious these days to just do that, right? You, you can't just do that. Uh, and expect you to make much of a difference. It's got to be a comprehensive program. Um, what we recommend is don't do it just once a year. Uh, do it along with the phishing. The other thing is uh, spread your training out. Do it once a quarter, um, hopefully even just like five-minute things. You know, we're, we're talking about short things maybe once a month. Just some fun little things to put it out there that, that keeps people thinking about it. And then monthly um, simulated phishing attacks are going to keep people looking for these, these phishing emails and they're going to keep them well practiced on spotting them. So if you put these together in a coordinated campaign, it can actually make a huge difference in what your folks are doing. Uh, stuff, uh, you want to do them random too. Don't send the same email to all the people at the same time because somebody is inevitably going to pop up and go, don't click on that Amazon one. Uh, so you spread it out and you randomize them. Uh, our platform lets you do a random person at a random day with a random email. So the other people in the area may never get the same email that they did, and they certainly won't get it on the same day. So uh, put a little bit of effort into doing that and spread it out as well. And then personalize them. Uh, just putting a first name isn't enough. Every marketer ever does that, right? Um, but what about having a little bit of fun with these once they start getting a little bit, you know, uh, better at spotting them in the first place, you throw in some attachments, you know, Q4 payroll, uh, Q1 layoffs, Christmas bonuses, whatever, things that are going to make them uh, interested, okay? Make it look like they were accidentally CC'd on something. Um, call out their boss's name, if that's something that you can find on like LinkedIn. A lot of times you can use things like LinkedIn or open source intelligence to find out uh, kind of a uh, an org chart 
So you put together an email that uh, you attach a, uh, uh, an invoice to, a quote unquote invoice to, and you say, hey, Bill, you know, uh, so-and-so, their boss's name, you know, Frank said you could take a look at this invoice and give me a hand. You, you know, you attach that invoice. Uh, this is what bad guys do. This is the kind of tricky stuff that they'll do if they're really targeting you. So make sure that you do some of that, especially in those key positions, uh, because they're going to be seeing attacks like that. So uh, we got a four-step program. Really, we do a baseline test. We train the users, uh, then fish the users and see the results. It's really not that complicated. Uh, the key is you get the baseline so you know where you're starting, and we can do that for you free. Um, that's part of a, a, a fish test that we do for you free. Then you train them so they know what they're looking for, and then the fishing uh, is something that you start again to remind them and to keep them a little bit paranoid and looking at those. The key thing is see those results, watch those results. And as they go down, as the click rates go down, make your phishing test a little bit harder. Um, so we recommend, we've seen that at least once a month is where it makes the biggest difference. Uh, if you do it like quarterly, people tend to forget they're not looking anymore. So the click rates don't really get impacted that much. Uh, or, or not as much as they could. Let me rephrase that. Um, but if you do it at least once a month, it's pretty significant in how the click rates work. So this was um, 9 million users, 18,000 organizations now, uh, over 20 million tests. So our baseline, uh, that's that one that we can do for you again for free. You can see how you kind of stack up to this 30% average click rate. Now, how many of you have a security control that fails 30% of the time? Would you leave it as is? Probably not, right? Think about it that way. Uh, after three months, that click rate was down to 15%. These are the same 9 million people. What's really impressive is at the end of 12 months, it's down to 2%. And the thing is, those are actually tougher emails than the initial um, phishing test usually is. So the people really can improve just by doing this. And this 9 million people, uh, the, the key on here was they had, to be, um, they had to be getting the simulated phishing tests at least once a month and they had to have finished the training. That was like so pretty much the key differentiators of the key things. We didn't cherry pick these, these are real numbers, uh, but it's pretty impressive. If you think that training people can't work, uh, hopefully this will really open your eyes to the fact that it can. So having said that, we got some resources for you here. Feel free to check them out. Um, these are all free. There's a ransomware simulator. This is great to check out. Uh, whether your endpoint protection actually sees that uh, that encryption process. Uh, I think the current one also does a crypto jacking test as well. So you're looking to see if maybe you need to tune your endpoint protection to be able to spot this stuff. And that's that to me, I, I, I love ransom. That's what it's called um, for just that reason. I think it's very, very important uh, to make sure that that endpoint protection is working before you get a real strain. And what this does, I, last I saw, it did like 13 different types of uh, ransomware simulations. Uh, based on the different strains and the actions that they used. Uh, and then that free, uh, the free phishing security test there, that's that uh, baseline that we can get you again. So check those out at nobefore.com slash resources for a bunch of free stuff. This is only like a, a small uh, sampling of what's out there. We also have one that does, uh, it'll test your mail servers and your filters to see what kind of files can get through there. So if you're not sure if you're blocking JavaScript or if you're not sure if you're looking in zip files, that can certainly help as well. So that being said, thank you very much. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, always happy to uh, have people reach out to me if you have questions or anything that we don't get to on uh, this particular uh, webcast. So David, do we have any questions? We sure do, Eric. Yeah, great presentation. It's always a, a pleasure to have you on. Your presentations are always so educational and I'm sure the audience feels the same way. Uh, first question here that came in, they're asking, uh, if they have antivirus on workstations, will that protect them from ransomware? Yeah, so we've, we've kind of mentioned this a little bit, but it, it, it's, gosh, it's so common to hear this uh, because, you know, antivirus is, is one of these really uh, hot topics, right, uh, in the industry too. Uh, but they've really done a good job of adding some of the AI and the heuristics on this. And, and this is what I'm saying, though, is you can't rely on it. Just like, uh, you know, we mentioned there's, there's layers involved here. And I like to think of it this way. The user is kind of the pivot between proactive and reactive stuff, right? So you have email gateways and things like that that block the bulk of the email from getting to the inbox. 
Uh, there's some things in place there. Once the user actually gets the email, now, once they click on this link or they launch that attachment, you now pivot to being reactive. And that means hoping your endpoint protection is going to catch it. That's you know, one of the key things that's going to happen there. You may hope that your uh, UTM firewall is going to spot the uh, command and control channel or you know, uh, your IDS or IPS is going to stop and block the command and control channel from that. Um, you know, you hope your backups work. That's that's where you've pivoted to that. And your endpoint protection is a key piece of that, but it is certainly not one of those things that you can rely on uh, to stop 100%. Just like you, you can't really stop anything in there 100% of the time, but I would say that your endpoint protection is probably uh, up there in the least reliable ways to protect yourself from ransomware. <laughs> okay, all right, excellent. Uh, let's see, another question here. How often should we fish our end users? Yeah, so this becomes a little bit of a question too. And I mentioned, you know, we see a drop off about um, once a month. If you don't do it at least once a month, then what happens is people stop looking for that. Life takes over. Um, they're not thinking about looking at the emails for the phishing uh, um, uh, tells, if you will, right? And we like to, we don't train people to try to be super technical here, right? We don't want them looking in headers and trying to figure out stuff like that. Basically, you're hovering links. Uh, you're looking at things like, did I get an email at 2 a.m. on a Saturday from my HR department? And is that normal? Well, uh, if it's not, maybe we need to be more careful, right? Um, if something elicits an emotional response, we need to be careful with that email. Okay, so those are the kind of things that we generally are, are teaching people not to be super, super technical. So spotting those tells is something that they, they kind of got to be watching for a little bit. And if you do it less than once a month, uh, we find that people start forgetting to watch for those sorts of tells and those. Um, I like to see it honestly happen uh, every two weeks, uh, if at all possible. Now, it seems pretty extreme and I would, I don't, don't necessarily know that I would recommend starting off on a two-week schedule, but as people are getting better at spotting these, as uh, organizations do fun things like actually um, make it into games, right? They gamify this process where it's like, hey, the lowest click rates um, or the most properly reported fishes in this amount of time get like a you know, a, a free parking spot, you know, or like a, an upgraded parking spot, or you get a gift card or the, you know, the group gets a, you know, pizza party, whatever it is. Uh, as we see that happen and we see people get into that where it's actually becoming gamified, it is no problem to fish your people, you know, every two weeks or so because they're looking for it. And, and once they're comfortable with it and they realize that you're not out to really, um, just make them look bad. They're like, ha ha, I got this. Nice try, suckers. We win this time. You know what I mean? And so it actually can be kind of fun and turn into a game. Uh, it just depends on how it's presented to the organization and, uh, and how that stuff goes. So I recommend, like I said, long story, uh, at least once a month, uh, go down to every two weeks if you can do it. Okay. All right. Very cool. I like the game of a gamification of that whole thing. Um, another question here that's kind of related is, and that is when you first fish your users, do you tell them that this is coming or, or is it kind of a, a surprise to them? Yeah. Um, what we generally do is when we do that, uh, phishing security test, kind of that baseline, we don't warn them. We don't tell them it's coming. Right. So the idea is, you want to see where they're really at in the real world. So what we'll do is we'll send that out to them. Uh, we typically don't even send a tough one, but that's the scary part is it's usually super easy. Um, like, Hey, it department needs you to change your password. You know, something just ridiculous like that. Um, and so we don't normally warn them on those. And if they click on something on those, one of the things that I recommend is you send them like a 404 page or something so they don't realize they've been fished and they just kind of move on with their day. They think it's a broken link or whatever, right? Um, now, when it comes down to actually doing the continuous testing, you absolutely want them to know that this is something that's happening. And I recommend you tell them before you even start the training, hey folks, we're going to do this process where we're going to do these simulated attacks so that we can make sure that you know how to spot the latest and greatest ones. And here's the training that's going to make you better at spotting these. So you're telling them, yes, we're going to be having an ongoing test here 
So you might want to pay attention in class. Um, and, and that can be a remarkable motivator when it comes to, um, you know, getting them to pay attention there. So I, I really believe that as it goes on, you absolutely let them know that this is happening. Okay, excellent. And then do you have different forms of, of phishing, different email uh, messages that you send to different levels of people or groups of people in the organization? Yeah, absolutely. Because there's a lot of areas that, uh, you know, they're going to be more prone to certain types of attacks than others, right? Um, if you send a wire transfer request to, um, you know, the, the facilities department, um, it's probably not going to make much sense as opposed to you sending it to someone in uh, finance or, you know, financial control or something like that. Uh, likewise, if you send a request trying to get W-2s from somebody you know, in a completely like a marketing department, they're not going to know that, but the people that are in HR are going to be subject to those sorts of attacks. So I highly recommend uh, that you do that. Now, our platform kind of makes that easy because everything's by categories and you can group individuals, um, even through Active Directory, it'll sync in with that and you can pull groups. So you say, everyone in finance, these are the, the types of the things that we want them to get. And you kind of mix it up a little bit but they're going to get those ones that are also specific to um, their particular department and areas. And it's pretty easy to set up and it's all automated once you've done it. So it's not a, it's not as hard as it may seem to be able to do this, um, but it is key that you at least expose them to the types of attacks that they're going to be exposed to in the real world. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, it sounds very easy to do. And it sounds like something that so many companies out there really need to implement uh, some form of security awareness training to prevent these uh, awful ransomware attacks so that they never have to go through a lot of the steps you, you uh, talked about there in the presentation through, you know, paying the ransom and everything like that. Um, Eric, if, if people want to get started with no before, can you tell us what's the first step that they typically should take? Yeah, um, you know, obviously our website, knowbefore.com is a great place to go. This is what I recommend. If you want to, to see this, get someone to give you a demo. You can do it in like 20, 30 minutes, get to see the platform. Uh, you can see what it's really all about. Uh, you can see all the training materials that we have out there. Um, I think we have like 900 different pieces of training materials and, and they range from the, the videos down to even like the posters that you can have printed and put on your wall. We take care of all that stuff to try to do the, uh, um, uh, you know, a campaign sort of approach to this. Uh, the thing is, it's, it's really hard to describe uh, the, the simplicity and the automation and those pieces and something like this. So get a demo, get, get one of those short little demos and, and see how this would work in your organization. Because frankly, if you have more than like two employees, um, you know, you're, you're at risk of this. I think we started about 25 uh, employee organizations but either way, uh, get a demo, get them to show you what it is we're talking about on that side. Um, and, and it'll make a lot more sense how easy it is to actually do this. So if you're looking at getting started, that's a way to do it. And then, hey, do one of those free phishing security tests. And that'll give you an idea of how vulnerable you really are, right? You throw in, uh, you know, hit about 100 people or so or, or however many you got. Um, and you can see what your click rates are. And I can pretty much guarantee you you're going to be surprised. Um, that's the thing I see all the time is people are like, oh, our people are pretty good. And then they get hit and they're like, oh man, I can't believe this. <laughs> um, so it's kind of eye opening sometimes. Uh, it's a little scary, but it definitely paints that picture for you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, Eric, it's been really great having you on. Thank you so much. Always happy to be here. Thanks for having me. For more information, check out knowbefore.com. Try that free ransomware test that Eric talked about. Also, download the ransomware hostage rescue manual from the GoToWebinar control panel right here in the event. You can download that and check it out later. And also, uh, feel free to each, uh, reach out to sales at knowbefore.com to schedule one of those demos and see the solution in action for yourself. Thank you to Noble for, for sponsoring today's event, and thank you everyone out there in the audience for attending.